Nice to see all of you. The, uh, I was just thinking this morning of how nice it is, how good it is, uh, that God has uh, brought together the body of, you know, the body of Christ. As you look through and read through in Ephesians and other places, and it talks and it tells about the giftedness of the body, and it all comes together, and that all, all parts work together. Uh, not just, it's not, never just one, it should never be just, well, it can't be just one. Uh, that's not how God designed it. And uh, just a good time to be able to rejoice in what he's done as we gather together. Just a couple things I want to point out to you in the bulletin. Uh, one is, remember to change the time next week. It's just nice when people show up, you know. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't change the time, then, then it'll be... We'll just change it. There's a seminar on the Old Testament coming up, Old Testament law. If you're interested in that at all, it's going to be in um, South Bend. But uh, Pastor Kent is going to uh, man, <clears throat> man the church bus and drive on up there for anybody who might want to be a part of it. There's information about it in the, uh, in the bulletin for you. And just a reminder, too, today's communion offering is going to help <clears throat> with the... Um, relief from the um, earthquake stuff in Turkey and Syria uh, through World Relief who has connections, already had connections with churches there and they're going to be working through those churches that they previously had connections with which is a nice, uh, just a nice uh, safety feature. I don't know, it's a nice way to, to make sure that it, that it was a good connection to start with. So that's always a good thing. Let's pray together as we as we continue. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace to us and your love. When we think of uh, the way in which you have and are building the body of Christ, it is a, a marvelous thing. It really is uh, to be able to, <clears throat> to, be able to uh, rejoice together and to be able to worship together, to be able to put forth our efforts together. And we want that all to be focused on you, not on us. We want it to draw attention to you as we, as we sing, as we hear scripture, as we uh, go through the sermon and even as we visit with one another that those would draw us into a closer relationship with you into more rejoicing rejoicing for the giftedness of the body the wisdom that you have shown as you pull together and bring together uh, the, those parts and uh, help us to function as as your body as your witness here on this earth that responsibility as well as that gift that you've given to us we want to continue to lift before you those uh, that we are aware of that, that are battling, that are struggling. Again, some of them are listed in the parent encouragement list. And when we think of uh, some of those physical challenges, Lord, we do ask that you would touch their bodies, that you would bring healing, that you would bring uh, strength, that you would bring wisdom, and that you would bring comfort. Uh, Father, and we think too of those who aren't listed, but yet we know, we know that they, phys that they uh, struggle physically, have some challenges, and also, Lord, others who we know spiritually and emotionally, it's just a, a tough time for some of them. And for each one, we would ask that you would come alongside, not only with your presence, but with something that will remind them of your presence, of your love, of your grace. Whether it's a scripture, whether it's a song, whether it's another person, um, whatever it is that you know, will connect with them, that you would do that and just remind them of your love and your grace, uh, your mercy, which is there for all times, and your power, which certainly can um, step in at any moment and change things. That's often what we look for. What you look for is that change in us. That's hard. That's hard on our end, and you know that. It's difficult for us not only to change, but to go through some of what it takes to bring that change about. And so we join together with our brothers and our sisters in that battle and in that struggle and lift them before you uh, for your grace and mercy. And again, just let them know your presence and your love. And as we're here, Father, we are reminded of your presence and love. We have many reminders all around us. We have them that have gone on in our life this week. We have them uh, that will be coming yet this week. Open our eyes to see you more clearly. Open our heart to follow you more uh, committed, w with a stronger commitment, with a deeper commitment, with a, 
with a deeper understanding, but even through our confusion, that we will, that we will not wander, we will not stray, uh, but we will follow you. So, Father, we give you our thanks, we give you our praise. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your presence with us. Uh, we're not asking you to join us. We're asking you to help us see you already here. And for that, we give you praise and thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Lauren's going to lead us in John, yeah, John chapter 3. Turn, on, turn to it, if you will, page 978 in the Pew Bible. Thank you, Pat. I'll give you a minute to turn there. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever, of bo whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you cannot know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, we speak, that we, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might, have, the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God.
always the way we, we respond to God. Uh, the offering is part of our response to God, part of our response for what he's done, for how he's cared for us, but also a, a huge part of it is our, our response to who he is, that he is God, that he is our Lord, that he is the one, our provider, our sustainer, uh, the one who cares for us and carries us through. So as the ushers come forward to receive your gifts and offerings this morning, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your care and love. Thank you so much for uh, not only caring about us, but caring for us and, and taking care of us. We ask that you would help us to not only see your hand more evidently, but to respond to you more, more vigorously, to respond to you more uh, quickly and more completely. Use this offering as an expression of our thanks uh, and, and praise to you that others might come to know Christ and also that we might be drawn deeper into our walk with you. We give with thanks in his name. Amen. Amen. We're all going to be in the offertory today. So sing it.
good song to draw our attention up to the Lord once again. As we share communion, um, of some verses that I was kind of pulled to um, from First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter two, uh, verses nine and ten. If you don't have them memorized, I'll read them for you. Um, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So I was thinking about communion, I, I, just these, these verses here kind of I, I, I was drawn to because it's a reminder, of, well, it's a statement of what communion should help us to remember. The tradition I was raised with, you know, we did things we thought to uh, give us standing with God whether it's baptism or communion or anything else. But the reality of communion is a reminder to us that we are a holy people. When we come to him, when we, when we ask him to be our savior, when we come to him for that forgiveness, he makes us holy. Taking communion doesn't make you holy. It's a reminder to you that you are holy by the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not because of anything that you have done or that you will do, but because of what he has already done. What he already did makes us holy. You say, well, I don't feel very holy. That's a good thing, really. Because what that does is reminds you of the need for that broken body and shed blood on your behalf. Now holy is looked at in a couple different ways in scripture. One is that you are set apart for God. And the other is that you are cleansed and made holy. You know, God said several times, be holy. Why? Because I am holy. And so he's calling us to that. He's calling us to that higher level of living and living for him, in him, with him, through him. But he is also reminding us that as holy, you are set apart for God's use. You are set apart to bring him glory and honor. You are set apart for him to work in you and through you, to touch others, to reach others, uh, to continue that, that transformation and growth even in, in, in yourself as you open up your life to him more and more. Communion is that reminder to us that we are a holy people. Cleansed by God, set apart for his use. Not because of what we have done, but because of his broken body and shed blood. You are a holy people. You know, this is what, what, he, what he's what he said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy through that broken body and shed blood of Christ. We are his. We are holy people who have received mercy because he took the punishment. He took the punishment that our sins deserve. And through that body that was broken and that blood was shed, we are extended mercy, forgiveness, and cleansing to be that holy people of God. Let's pray together. Father, um, Thank you seems very inadequate, but also very necessary. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Jesus, thank you for going to that cross. Thank you for giving your life. 
Thank you for having that wisdom, Father, to uh, provide for our cleansing, our forgiveness, our calling into your family, into your, to be one of your people. And now we remember what that costs. Um, what is free to us was not free. We remember and reflect and think of what it must have been like on that cross. Innocent, dying for us. Shedding your blood that our sins might be forgiven and we can stand before you as a holy people receiving your mercy because of what Christ did on that cross. Please accept this as an expression and an act of thanks, praise, and worship to you, the only one who is worthy for what you have done in our, for us on that cross and making that available to us even now. Continue to build us and strengthen us to more and more be your holy people chosen by you to be holy, stand in this world that others might come to know Christ who died for their sins as well. We give you thanks for this time and this remembrance together in his name, amen. I'm gonna ask the elders and the deacons to join me up front as we um, share these elements with you and just a reminder for you that we're gonna pass the bread first uh, you take a minute and just between you and God, you, you think of what he's done for you on that cross and thank him. And then you take that on your own and then we will pass the cup and hold on to that. And we're going to take that together to celebrate uh, that unity of the body that is ours in Christ. As we typically do, we're going to take up a benevolent offering now. Ushers, if you would come forward, and just a reminder that this, uh, the offering that we're taking up is going for the relief of uh, the situation in, with the um, earthquake uh, that occurred a few weeks ago in uh, three months area. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we are grateful for the gift of your Son as we have just celebrated recognizing our unity in uh, Jesus Christ. And... Um, the significance of his death for us in the past that has significantly offered, uh, altered our future, uh, that we might be your people, that one day we will be in the same place and God will be our God and we will be his people and we rejoice in that. And Father, in the meantime, we live in a world that is, uh, that is uh, afflicted in many ways and we've had this earthquake and we pray, Lord, for this offering, that you would bless this offering. Um, and use it, that you would use it in exponential ways to bring relief and the gospel to those who have suffered um, because of this uh, earthquake in Turkey. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children's for children for children's church. Are we good to go? There we go. That's the picture. Huh? How about it? They have fun down there, but this is a birthday party. I hope you are enjoying our, um, our study through Colossians. More than that, I really hope that you're learning. I hope that, that um, God is using his word as we have been going through Colossians. I hope that it's been helping you to draw closer to God, more stable, uh, in your faith, more um, confident in your relationship with him, more consistent in living in union with him. This is really part of the, the goals of always looking at, at his word, that you would be drawn you know, deeper in him. Today we're going to continue uh, with how our relationship with Christ should affect how we relate to one another. This is what, uh, what he's stepped into 
as we've been going through the letter, what, uh, what Paul was, was leading into as he was writing to the uh, Colossians then. Uh, now, we looked, you know, last week, not just in the previous verses of Colossians, but also looked at some guidance in a broader manner from the scriptures as what he has, what he has told us and, you know, what he has given us there. Because the best interpreter of scripture is always scripture. Uh, that's the best interpretation you can get. You know, what does this mean? God's word does not contradict himself. So when you think that you have found something that's contradictory, uh, that's a good time for you to dig a little deeper. It's time for you to, to uh, look for more of, of what he has to say to us. Last week, the verses uh, dealt and focused pretty much on the relationship between a husband and a wife and, and children, you know, a family, really. Um, you know, and it, we saw that the husband should step up and lead his family, you know, lead his family in their pursuit of and growth in Christ. Uh, and part of that leadership, we're told there, is that the husband loves the wife with the same depth of love that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. As we were pulling in the other scriptures, you know, we, we saw that very clearly. The husband's not to ignore his wife. He is not to run roughshod over his wife, nor is he to impose his will on his wife. Uh, and again, you know, just remind you what he's writing here. As he's as he's writing, um, you know, everyone here is 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 not married, uh, you know. But whatever God leads you into those relationships, uh, you may you know, they should be godly relationships. They should be ones that honor God, and this is His word to us. Uh, you know, a husband should be realizing that his wife's an equal in Christ because, it, well, we're told that again in Scripture. And he needs to consider her thoughts and her feelings as well. Now, one of the things I didn't mention last week, but you have, have, <laughs> have heard me mention it before, um, if a husband and a wife disagree on something, um, the husband should not force his will on his wife because she might be right. but she also might be wrong. You see, uh, uh, the problem is that both the husband and the wife could be wrong. Both the husband and the wife could be, could be uh, either misunderstanding God's direction and God's leading. The husband and the wife might be uh, influenced by something else, whether it's uh, something, a physical condition going on in one of them or whether some of the challenges you know, of life, or, you know, maybe they just ticked each other off. That happens on occasion. Uh, Jenny's ticked me off every now and then, you know, and I, I don't know why, because it's, I'm an easy guy to live with. All you have to do is my way. Um, but isn't that how we approach life? We want others to do it our way, the way we think it should be done. And when it doesn't happen the way we think it should be done, that's when, that's when the rub starts. That's when it begins to get annoying. That's when, you know, if that, if that continues, you know, if it continues more and more and more, uh, it gets to be a big problem. I was talking with a fellow on Thursday who's running um, his second marathon. He ran a marathon in Columbia City uh, at the end of last year, and he's running the Chicago Marathon. Well, the Chicago Marathon uh, was the first one I did, and so we were talking about that. And uh, one of the things, you know, that that I, I told him and just reminded him of, I said, what, whatever you're, uh, you know, whatever you're going to do in in the race, you need to do that while you're training. Whatever it is, what the clothes you're going to wear and everything else, because uh, here's the problem. You see, a little irritant. A little irritant, you know, when you're walking around is one thing, but that little irritant over and over and over again, over the long haul, gets to be painful. Uh, I still remember, you know, when I was when I was doing the long runs and training for, uh, you know, the marathons, that um, just the, the loop on my shoelace, when I stepped forward, was just just touch, just tapping. Just tapping my foot right there. By 15 miles, it was more than annoying. By 20 miles, it was painful. 
You see, sometimes we think that we can ignore the little things in a relationship and it's not going to make any difference. But over the long haul, what do we do? We let it keep hitting us. We let it keep tapping us. We let that keep going. And you know what? It gets annoying. And if we don't do anything about it, it gets painful. Painful to that relationship. You know, whether it's between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, which he also gets into, between friends, between neighbors, whatever else, if you don't take care of that, if you don't take care of what you think is just a little thing, you know, if you don't do something to deal with it, it, it's going to end up tearing a relationship apart. Uh, you know, so when the husband and the wife disagree, the husband should love his wife enough uh, to search for God's will together with his wife. And the wife should love her husband enough to search together for God's will for her husband, you know, with her husband. Because, you know, here's the thing you've heard me say before, you know, while the husband and the wife may be confused about what God wants for them, I assure you, I guarantee you, God is not the least bit confused about what he wants for you as husband and wife or as an individual God is not the least bit confused about what he wants for you about what he has called you to about what he wants for you in each and every situation so if you are confused and if you as a husband and wife are confused you need to seek God together if you as an individual are confused here here's the problem when it's an individual you see we just think well we got it and we we plow ahead you see but God has given us a gift in marriage that we have someone along who cares about us and who cares for us and who's walking together after God with us, hopefully, you know, and even if they're not, well, you know, this is a great opportunity to be able to seek God together because you know what? He is not the least bit confused about what he wants for you. And a husband and wife should be working as a team. They complement, they complete one another. You know, they, they complete one another as they pursue God together. And then it goes on and talks about with children. The husband should also lead in guiding their children to pursue God. The husband's told not to exasperate their children. And that would also be direction to the wife, you see, but it seems that the father may have a greater tendency to do so. Um, but the wife is not immune to such behavior. That's, regardless of what the world tells us, God made us differently, men and women. And generally speaking, women relate better with feelings and caring than men do. And the word to fathers not to exasperate their children. So here's the goal. Let me just sum, summarize that, the, the, those fir, that first group of verses there that we went over last week. You know, the goal for the husband is to do all he can to see that his wife and children grow to be all they can be in Christ. And the wife's responsibility, the wife's goal, is to do all that she can to see that her husband and children grow to be all they can be in Christ. This is really the, you know, what he's telling us in, in those verses there. God always put a high value on the family, on the family unit. Husband, wife, children, he's always had a high value on that. Let's pray we're going to continue on as we, as we look at this whole idea of interacting and relating to one another. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance and direction. Make that very clear to us now. Sometimes we are confused. We don't want to be. We want to see you more clearly. We want to grasp a hold of you. We've been singing about that. We want you to open up uh, not just the heavens, but your word, your will to us that we might see you, that you might talk to us, that you might speak to us from your word and from what you are doing in our lives, that we will see not only your hand, but your very clear direction for us. Guide us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, if you want to turn there. We're going to begin with verse 22, and we're going to go on into the first verse of chapter 4. It's really a continuation of what he's been saying to husbands, wives, and children uh, regarding relationships and care for one another. 
he begins here addressing slaves. Slaves often were part of the household. Uh, they were, you know, in the home and part of that operation. Uh, but look at what he's saying here, verse 22. It says, slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while, while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Now in the history of our nation, uh, these are some of the verses that were used to try to justify slavery. That is a gross misuse of scripture. That was a gross misuse of the word of God. As you're looking at this here, you know, Paul is not condoning slavery here or anywhere else. And to say that this passage in, encourages or condones slavery is proof texting with twisting the, the word of God to say something that God does not actually say. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to those in slavery, he says, Were you called while a slave? It should not be a concern to you. But if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity. He tells slaves if they can gain their freedom from slavery, he says, then by all means, take that opportunity. Uh, you know, when, as we're going through, you know, we're going to pull in some other verses as we, as we walk through this. But what he's, what he's writing here in, in Corinthians, what he's writing here in, in Colossians, he is writing to a situation that was going on at the time. He is, he is writing, you know, to, to slaves in a society where slavery was part of the society, where slavery was part of the culture. It was a fact of life for them. He's not saying that slavery is acceptable at all. That's not what he's saying. It was a reality that they lived with. Christianity, Christianity and coming to Christ does not automatically change the situation you are in. Because they came to Christ, it did not change the society in which they found themselves living. It did not change the reality of what was acceptable in that society and the way the society ran. They were members and part of that society, and he's telling them, look, in this situation that you're in, when you come to Christ, it still can have an effect, should have an effect in how you are living. And this is what he's telling them. He never says that slavery is fine. Their commitment to Christ did not change the reality of living in a society that condoned slavery. We live in a society that condones abortion. God's word is very clear to us that as his people, we should behave differently. He's writing to them and he's telling them, you live in a society that condones and has a part of their society that is, flies in the face of what God would tell them needs to happen. And he's saying, so here's how you need to live. He addresses both slaves and masters, the slaves first, really. It almost looks like he gives four verses uh, to the slaves and only one to the masters, but those, those three verses in the middle uh, really uh, apply both ways. All of them really ap uh, apply all the way here. Look at verse 22. He says, Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. You know, as with the word that he said to husbands and to wives and to children, he puts, you know, the obedience here, the obedience called for is what would be in line, he says, you know, with fearing the Lord. That's, that's the, I was going to say restriction. That's the limit that God, that God puts there in all of those relationships. It's always in what is keeping, what is in keeping, you know, with the Lord. You know, what he says here would be, you know, applicable to any of us in any work we do. He says, in everything, work wholeheartedly to please the Lord. 
You know, work wholeheartedly to please the Lord. Work, put in that effort, put in that energy, put in that time, put in that diligence. Wholeheartedly work in whatever, you know, he says, you know, whatever you're doing, whatever, work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. That word wholeheartedly, some of the translations say with sincerity of heart. It means without any pretense, without any hypocrisy. You know, that you are not just play acting, but you are sincerely giving your best effort. It, that you're doing more than just getting by. You're doing more than just the minimum. You're doing more than uh, just what it takes. Now, uh, slavery in their time, some would be slaves to pay off a debt. And, and you know, so if they were, if they, we, we saw that, you know, in the Gospels when Jesus was, I think we looked at that last week, when Jesus was, was uh, giving them the parable of, of the man who owed those, those talents. Uh, and what was it, 60? 60 talents? I, I forget exactly what it was. Uh, well, it, it amounted to 6 million denarii, you know. So anyway, he, he you know, he, those, those talents that he owed, uh, and then he was forgiven. Think of it in dollars, you know. He was given, forgiven $6 million worth of a debt. It's really more than that because a denarii was a day's wage. So he was, he was forgiven six million days wages, and then he um, left, the master came across a slave, a, another slave who owed him a hundred denarii. Again, not a small sum of money, a hundred days wages, uh, but compared to what he was forgiven, well anyway, he wouldn't forgive that slave. And you know, we forget sometimes what God has done for us. You know, we, we forget, and it says wholeheartedly, without any pretense, without any hypocrisy, that what we're going to do then is, you know, we're going to open ourselves and our lives up to God, and we are going to be changed. Now, they were slaves in order to pay off a debt. What, one of the things that the uh, master first said to the first guy, he said, you know, everything you have is going to be sold, you know, and you're going to put in slavery to pay off that debt. It was a life sentence. You know, it was a life sentence. And, and someone, some people then would be uh, slaves to pay off a debt. Some were slaves because they were captives uh, of a war. One of the things they would do is resettle the population. When Fort Wayne conquers New Haven, they would take the people out of New Haven and, you know, and, and bring them to Fort Wayne, and they would serve as slaves. You know? and some of them were slaves by choice. They made a choice so that they would be taken care of. One of the things that goes on in our society that we don't see sometimes is some people want to get arrested so that they can be taken care of. They want to go to jail so that they can have meals, they can have a place to sleep, some because they need medical care. And we don't see this, so we don't think that this happens. This is what happened in their time, too. You know, but in all situations, the slave was still considered property. You know, we don't, uh, I, I'd like to tell you we don't have that in our society, but there's, there's human trafficking going on, you know, in our society, which is abhorrent. Um, uh, anyway, um, you know, the, the, the slave could still, was still considered property, could be abused even to the point of death. So when you look at this and we say, well, it's a good boss-employee relationship, well, while we can learn some things about that, um, it, it, a boss-employee relationship certainly wouldn't be as intense. Um, uh, even if your boss is the biggest jerk in the world, uh, you know, Kent's isn't. But the, uh, you know, to, to, you know so, so that, uh, you know, it, it's a more intense relationship that they had, which in some ways, you know, for us, and making the choice to follow these directions even makes more of an impact because you can quit your job but if you're going to instead, you know, work as God calls us to, they didn't have that option. They didn't have the option to quit. And, but he tells them, he says, don't work only while being watched in order to please men. Your work ethic, you know, your work ethic should be the same whether you're being watched or if no one's watching at all. You know, the, it should be the same. There should be no, no, no change. You're working in order to please God, not because you fear some sort of retaliation, not because you fear some sort of, of repercussions there. You know, it's not only for the credit and recognition of some sort. You are working, it, it says, you know, in, you're not working in order to please men, which pulls us right into verses 23, 24. He says, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically 
as something done for the Lord. Whatever it is you're doing, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the word and inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Now, to restrict, restrict the application of this verse only to slaves is foolish. Uh, you know, it would probably you know, only be done to cover laziness, which is, uh, which is also a sin. Uh, it seems that that word translated here where it says, whatever you do, it seems that that word is definitely a, br a bit broader than just whatever. Um, I think it could be better translated uh, whatever and whenever. You know, whatever you do and whenever you do something, it's really, it's all inclusive. That word is an all inclusive word. It's whatever you're doing, whenever you're doing it, whatever it is you find yourself doing. He said, you know, do it enthusiastically. Enthusiastically, the word literally means from the soul. You know, do that from the soul. Put, you know, put in your very best effort from a deep internal commitment to Christ because it's the Lord Christ you're working for, he says. So you're doing it enthusiastically because you, you realize that it, it's, it's because of your commitment to Christ, not for recognition or accolades of men. You know, he says you do everything in service to and from your commitment to Christ. That's where it flows from. Every single thing you do, always live for the Lord. In every single thing you do, without exception, without hesitation, without holding something aside, do everything in service to God. Last week, um, I went to visit someone, and I had to use the restroom. And so I went to use the restroom. Um, I, I, I noticed um, in there that the uh, toilet was clogged. Well, you know, you never want to do that in somebody else's house. And I thought, well, I noticed it was clogged because the bowl was full. And I thought, eh, flushing that would be really stupid. And so I, you know, I had a choice. I, I could have just gone and used a different restroom and left it like it was, you know. But I noticed a plunger there, so I grabbed a plunger and um, plunged somebody else's... Uh, clog uh, it was it, it, it was gross it was you know a, a bit disgusting um, you know but um, I wasn't even sure I was going to fix the situation you know how it is sometimes and um, I do everything enthusiastically and I didn't want it too enthusiastically plunge because uh, the water was full and you know I was trying to be discreet and all that um, uh, and and um, you know, up until now, uh, myself and God were the only ones who, who knew that I did this, but the verse here tells us, whatever you do, and whenever you do something, do it enthusiastically, putting forth your very best effort as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of inheritance from the Lord because you serve the Lord Christ. Let me ask you, what do you see is beneath you? what's beneath you? you know, where do you draw the line on what you won't do for someone? Let me ask it to you this way as you look at this verse. What wouldn't you do for the Lord? What wouldn't you do for the Lord? Because it says here, whatever you do, whenever you do something, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. What wouldn't you do for the Lord? Because this verse tells me everything I do, I serve the Lord. And whatever I do, whenever I do it, Everything, everything, you know, whenever I do anything, it says here that I serve the Lord. Verse 25 says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. See, no one is getting away with anything. No one is getting away with anything, so serve the Lord. 
You know, now we might think we're being sneaky sometimes, you know, and that we can get away with something, uh, you know, and, and we might be, we should be troubled by some of the things other people are doing. I'm hoping that you're troubled by some of the things you see going on around you and some of the things you hear on the news. I hope it troubles you. What bothers me sometimes is what doesn't bother me. And then I'm thinking, why, this should bother me, you know. Uh, but we get so used to it sometimes. Uh, you know, and we, you know, we should be bothered by some of what's going on. But things, you know, things not getting revealed, you know, here on, on, on earth, but it says the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. The wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. Now, let me tell you, don't be pleased by that verse. Well, they're going to get theirs. Don't be pleased by that verse. Be concerned by that verse. You know, be concerned by, you know, by what it says. It may seem sometimes like the, you know, like the wicked prosper, but in the end, which is really what matters, if they stay wicked, if they stay wicked till the end, they will lose eternally. That should bother us. You know, if, if someone does not come to Christ Jesus for forgiveness of their sins, you know, and then the only fallback they have, the only thing they have to fall back on, if they don't come to Christ for forgiveness of their sins, what we were just celebrating in communion, that his broken body, his shed blood, you know, for us, if they don't, if they don't come to Christ, you know, if they don't come to God through Christ's sacrifice for us, the only thing they have to fall back on is what they have done. That's the only thing they have to fall back on. And we can never, we can never, ever do enough good to overcome the sin we have done. Titus 3, 5. King James, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You know, it says here, he saved us not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy. We can never do enough good to overcome the bad. Ephesians chapter 2, for you are saved by grace through faith. This was not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works that no one can boast. You are never going to be able to do enough works to overcome the bad. And just so you know, this applies to everyone. Romans 3, for all have sinned. Every single one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace, not through their works, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as that propitiation, as that payment, as that satisfaction through faith in His blood to demonstrate His righteousness because in his restraint he passed over the sins previously committed. It's not because of what he has done. It's because of his mercy. It's because of his grace. It's because of his provision, that propitiation, that payment, that, that settlement in his blood that we are forgiven. God is gracious, but he's not foolish. You know, he is fair, loving, and just, but he is not wishy-washy. Uh, you know, you know, he knows everything, he sees everything, he understands everything. No one will get away with anything. That's what the Word of God says. Let's wrap up with uh, the first verse of chapter 4 there. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Now it would be quite easy for them to take advantage of a slave, because after all, they were slaves. You know, and, and what, what could they say? What could the slaves say? You know, how could they complain? Who would they complain to? You know, who would care? They were slaves. You know, instead of taking advantage of either the position or the power as master, uh, you know, or the slave's position as slaves even, uh, you know, they're called to be caring and humble and remember the Lord. Supply your slaves with what is right and fair. 
since you know that you too have a master in heaven. They were not to treat their slaves, and we could say we're not to treat others, you know, according to the way others treat one another. They were, you know, they were, they were called not, you know, not to treat their slaves just like everyone else treated their slaves. We were called not to treat others just the same way other people, you know, treat others. Uh, you know, they're not to, not to treat them according to the standards of, soci of society. We're not to treat others according to the standards of our society. The call here is to remember God is your master and treat others in light of God's care for you. You too have a master in heaven, he says. You too have that master in heaven. God is patient, he's caring, he's generous with you, you know, and he is for you. He wants you to do well. And this is how he's called us to treat others and to interact with others. You know, whatever you do, and whenever you do anything, and whoever you are with, follow the Lord. Not those around you, not society, not the situation, not your feelings. Follow the Lord in everything, at every time, with every person. Look at, look at the, the points in your outline again. You know, every, everything, every time, with every person, please the Lord. Live for the Lord. Serve the Lord. Remember the Lord. Follow the Lord. Who are you going to follow? Follow the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be yours. And again, I'm just reminded and thank you for those who have followed you well, who have followed you in a way that we were able to see and we were able to see what a difference it makes to be yours and what a difference it makes to live for you. Uh, Father, thank you for their example. Now we need to live our life for you. We need to live in such a way that others will see you are our master. You are the one calling the shots for us. Not so that they praise us, but so that they might come to know you. So that they might come to the reality of what it means to have a relationship with you, to have forgiveness, to have life in you. Help us to live it in such a way, Father, that there is no doubt in our minds or in anyone else's mind, but that we are yours and have that relationship with you. Help us to follow you well, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand together for the benediction? And as we close, if you need prayer for anything, uh, Jess is one of our deaconesses. She'll be up here to pray with you and to pray for you. Uh, Ron is one of our deacons. He'll be up here as well to pray with you and to pray for you. Uh, and other elders and deacons will be watching if you need prayer for anything no matter what it is what's you know maybe it's something you heard in a sermon or maybe you just got a tough week coming up and you want someone to pray with you pray for you as we dismiss you come on up ron will be up here jess will be up here others will be watching as well and now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to set us before his presence without fault and with great joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and dominion both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen.